No, you, you might say, well, price is what price is. I haven't seen any difference, so I do the same job as before. Nothing really has changed. Um, I know people who have lost their home, uh, their job, um, and a large part of their savings. But if you don't and think uh, you might not be affected, then um, think about other things happening already in terms of taxation and uh, inflation. Now, just a few days ago, I met someone from Canada, and he said the last time he was here was a year ago, and he was astonished how cheap everything is. Well, that's good for him, that's bad for us, because it means everything that we're going to buy, which is imported, um, is more expensive, and inflation is going to rise. Look at about the government spending. It's not only about Greece, same in, in the UK. So there will be an inevitable uh, there will be higher inflation and tax we have seen the one of tax uh, for uh, for banking bonuses uh, we have a new directive coming into place um, that will in impact compensation um, so um, there is a lot of things happening that will impact what are already impacting us today and what I thought uh, I just spent uh, half a minute on the capital requirement directive. And I don't know how familiar you are with this. Um, people from HR probably are very familiar with it because it has a direct impact on uh, new compensation structures. And uh, looking at it, um, I just picked out a few examples because it, ha it, it covers 23 principles how compensation for financial institutions should be uh, implemented um, from next year on. And uh, the most significant which also have to some extent been discussed in the press is that 40% um, of bonuses need, need to be deferred for three to five years. And uh, for very high bonuses, they're even talking about 60%. Not more than 30% uh, should be paid out in cash anymore. Uh, it should be paid out in other instruments like stocks, for example. Then banks have to report the number of people earning more than a million, and there are specific tests for people working or uh, receiving bonuses in, in, in uh, government-owned banks. And um, the question is, is that, is that a solution? I think there is a problem to understand the impact of the individual performance to the company's performance. So there is the assessment or the measurement issue. Then you have the issue of skill versus luck. So someone who is very lucky might get a big bonus. And more importantly, this directive covers financial institutions in the EU. Well, is that good enough? But what the, the main question I thought that arrives from this is, um, what does it mean for London, for the city? So is London losing its edge as an um, employer of choice for, for talent? Now, um, uh, I looked at some statistics um, from Selby Jennings, and uh, they actually said even after this, and even after the taxation, high paid individuals in the finance industry still earning more, 50% more in, in, in London than for example in Zurich and Geneva, because that has been used as an example. It's not in the EU, it's not so far. Um, but then think about it, the real financial centers are only two, it's New York and London. That's really where we should look at. And in the US, we see similar developments in regulation. Um, and then uh, if you look again, um, Zurich and Geneva, the influx of, of new talent, there's a limit to it. If there is an oversupply, it also has an impact on compensation. So basically, um, I don't think that <coughs> London really is losing its edge. Uh, also, they, they, they had some comparison in terms of mid-tier uh, employees. Where Again, in London, 15 to 25 percent higher salaries, total compensation, than in uh, Geneva. But then, more importantly, and I can relate to this because I lived in Geneva for three years. Um, it's a different country, different culture, different language. I can't see people moving from London there, getting their kids to school, uh, and suddenly speaking French. It's not that easy, and I don't see the exodus that some people have mentioned in. Uh, in, uh, in the press, for example. So I don't think that's actually going to happen. Now, that's more like the impact today. And uh, what is more interesting, what will the future look like? What does it actually all mean? Uh, and how could uh, compensation 
uh, look like in the future. And you might have guessed it already, one of the big themes is going away from, from financial incentives to non-financial incentives. And there have been a lot of uh, theories around this for quite some time, and they're popping up again and are more uh, of relevance. And um, I picked out two, one is uh, the identity economist. Um, there are two um, academics, uh, George Ekerlof and Rachel Drayton, who in, in the mid-90s developed um, economics that can explain, for example, um, why do people take jobs at the military church or NHS if they could get much higher paid jobs somewhere else? Traditional economics can't explain this. Or why is it that um, the pattern of women smoking versus men has changed so much over the last 50 years. Traditional economics can't explain this. So what, what they try to do is they try to uh, include a new factor which they call social identity that also has an impact about, uh, on decision making. And uh, I mean, in HR you can use this as an advantage to attract people without the financial side of it. It's more relating to non-financial side. Uh, specifically, they also recommend to link pay to fiduciary responsibilities and to client outcome rather than company outcome. Then uh, the other big issue, and I'm sure that um, the HR people uh, amongst us know quite well, uh, is employee engagement. It's kind of a buzzword uh, these days, but it's nothing new. I mean, already in the 90s, I think it was William Kahn who conceptualized the, um, the, the ideas. And what it actually does is it tries to in involve employees much more in decision making, make them feel more involved. In it. These are all uh, areas that will be uh, much more significant going forward than they have been in the past. I believe, I strongly believe that uh, financial incentives are important, but they will be less important going forward. To one extent, we see the impact uh, from the regulatory side. So um, the way going forward to attract top talent and to keep top talent is using uh, techniques and ideas, uh, for example, from employee engagement. Uh, another issue I, I uh, mentioned is work-life balance. And uh, for people who went through the crisis, were in organizations that laid off uh, a large part uh, of their employees uh, and, and, and have, to, have to do much more than they had to do. They're not what that means. So I would say, um, Let's look at non-financial incentives and how they can be used to construct reward systems um, that attract and also keep our top talent. Now, that is a bit of a background for my side. I'm really interested in your views, your ideas, and also uh, in your critical points of some of the ideas I've mentioned, because um, um, you might have a completely <coughs> different view and think, well, it's all about pay, and then let's have have a discussion about it. And with that, I think I, I, I leave it here, and I'm looking forward uh, to your um, ideas and questions.